Five more SEC football spring games are officially in the books as spring practice comes to a close across the best conference in the land. I'm joined by Blaine Gilmer, as I was around this time last week, to talk everything we saw yesterday from Norman, Austin, Starkville, Columbia, and College Station. Blaine, what's going on, my friend? we got a lot to discuss here on this Sunday night. It's hard to believe you and I were talking about before the show. It's hard to believe that spring ball has come and gone. I mean, it's over with, and now before you know it, we'll turn around and it'll be, you know, close to that Memorial Day weekend, and it kickoff will be here before too long. But we got some, we got some stuff we got to break down before then. Yeah, for sure, we got a lot to get into. Again, Hope Springs a turn on the off season. We'll get into that later. But of course, again, five spring games yesterday. I loved seeing, by the way, Blaine. On a side note, the the controversies over attendance, which always seem to come up this yeah. time of year, spring game attendance numbers. You, you can never have I, – I saw a post. It was Texas, Oklahoma, and Texas A&M fans all arguing, all taking jabs at each other. And I'm sitting there playing like, we need real football. We need real yeah. football on the field because right now we got fan bases arguing over spring game attendance numbers and not just attendance numbers, but attendance numbers in horrific weather. So, tis the season, Blaine. Yeah, the, the circular firing squad there between those schools around each other. But but when it comes down to it, that's the passion of the SEC, right? That's what we love. That's why we do this. That's why we're able to talk about ball all year long is because everybody has that passion for it and excited to to dive into not only that, but all the product that was on the field, what it means with the rest of this portal window open, uh, who has to address some things, and what was kind of glaring out there, good and bad for these teams. So, Blaine, that being said, let's go ahead and dive into it. We'll start in Austin, Texas, and talk the Texas Longhorns. Of course, as life in the SEC is set to begin this fall, all eyes are on that. Very important spring for Steve Sarkees against program. First thing that jumps off the page in this game, Blaine, you got to start with Arch Manning. I know that the spring game is a great place for backup quarterbacks to make a name for themselves or put up numbers, but... We saw him do this last year. We saw him on the field in very limited action, of course. I don't think there's a debate. Quinn Ewers is this team's QB1, but – and I know it's just a spring game, and we can talk about the secondary, obviously, maybe some of the defensive question marks because the secondary was a huge question for them last season. So I'm sure it's some mixed feelings if you're a Texas fan, but this Arch Manning kid, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. He's a Manning, but it looks like Texas is pretty well set at the quarterback position for years to come. Yeah, he was smooth. And I think more than more so than the yardage and, and the touchdowns, all that kind of stuff was just operating at the quarterback position. He looks comfortable. He looks, you know, manning ass with his feet. And people people a lot of times talk about when they talk about Eli and Peyton Manning, they talk about, you know, the 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 arm and when they were younger the the arm strength and the, the accuracy and all that well it all starts with your feet and and he has that those manning feet. He's able to to be efficient in his drops he's always never out of position he's always has always has a platform to be able to throw the football and he showed that by completing i believe his first nine passes of the game without an incompletion so obviously that's the big excitement there as you have those big plays from all the quarterbacks also a freshman quarterback for texas making big plays as well you do have to look on the other side and say come on secondary what are we doing because some of those it's not like all of those Arch was just dotting up. Some of them were wide open. Nobody's around them. And, hey, that's that's where – you give credit where credit's due. Arch made those throws, and they have speed all over the field at receiver, um, particularly Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo stepped up, made big plays, some of those for Arch Manning. But, my goodness, uh, the secondary was nowhere to be found at times, Chris. Yeah, and you look at the stats, by the way, highlighting Arch Manning. 11-13 for 190 and two touchdowns in the first half. That was the first half. His final stats, 19-25, 355, three touchdowns. And to your point, Blaine, it's the thing that can drive us batty when it comes to talking spring football because if one side does well, that means the other side struggles. And, you know, it's great to see Arch Manning doing well. We all want to see offense, right? I think naturally we all still uh, – most of us, I'm sure there's some diehards out that love to see 10 to 7 ball games. Most of us want to see offense and high-flying scoring plays, whatever deep touchdown passes. But after the struggles that Texas had a season ago in the secondary, let's just say nothing was done to 
make anybody feel any better that that unit's going to be going to take this massive step forward. I think you could argue, Blaine, that's a reason for concern and certainly a question mark going in the year for Texas. Yeah, I mean, and listen, and to be fair, uh, Jade Barron didn't play in this game, so that's one guy uh, kind of at that nickel position that that wasn't in and, and wasn't there. But way on the back end, it just seemed like they – now, a lot of these – Chris, you know as well as I do that a lot of these are predetermined what coverages you're going to be allowed to play, can play. They played a lot of single high, which if you give a, a quarterback like Arch Manning or Quinn Ewers and those receivers a lot of single high coverage, you're going to create some mismatches all the way. But nonetheless, when guys are getting caught flat-footed in the second and third level, whether it's passing off people to different zones, if you're playing zone coverage, or just – not being able to stay in phase in man coverage, that is a concern. So I think that's somewhere that, and we I think we saw at times, we saw Blue and Baxter and Red at running back be able to kind of have their way in the offensive line that we talked about, uh, you talked about with our, our friends at, you know, uh, TS, TSU. Um, their offensive line is really experienced. Okay, other than Cam Williams at right tackle, everybody else is a, a returning starter. And they kind of, you know, had their way with the run game a little bit. And I think a lot of that has to do with this team still, and I think they will add some. They still need a few bodies on that interior defensive line, I think, to, to, mm -hmm. to either step up or to be brought in on this roster. So some concerns on the defensive side. But, man, the weapons, like we said, the running back room, solid trio, those new guys at receiver, are going to be great. I, th I didn't. We didn't even see Isaiah Bond get fully incorporated in this game. He was a little bit, but man, you know what he's going to be able to do. And they didn't show everything with mm -hmm. Quinn Ewers, right? It's not like they're going to put a ton of stuff out on tape for everybody, all that kind of stuff. But like you said, there's give and take both sides. And Blaine, to your point, the Texas offense, we've spent so much time this offseason talking about Ole Miss and others. The Texas offense is going to be as fun to watch as anybody in the SEC and showing a little bit of love to the interior defensive line, defensive line as a whole. Alfred Collins, I thought, channeled a little bit of his uh, – and, and Ricky Williams there on the pick six. 6'5", 321, by the way, is what he measures. He outran the entire offense on that pick six. First play of the game, by the way. So a very interesting start to that Texas spring game. Uh, let's go to the other side of the Red River rivalry, Blaine. We'll stick with that. We'll talk the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, in Norman, of course, they had their spring game. Weather affected a lot of these, but moving around some kickoff times. Thankfully, we were able to get them in. Like we mentioned, just like for Texas playing, for Oklahoma as well, life in the SEC is just around the corner. And, and what I sense from talking to Oklahoma folks, a little bit of a different vibe, a, a chip on the shoulder. They're being doubted, which Oklahoma football is not used to, right? Heck, I've done my share of doubting. Maybe some of us others, we've done some share of doubting as well. Vegas has got this team at over under six and a half. So there's this extra level of emphasis for a program that has such a proud and rich history and tradition like OU has. I know Dion Burks, he showed some signs on the outside. Uh, thought overall it was a positive spring game, positive spring effort for OU. What did, what did you see, Blaine, specifically from Oklahoma in their game yesterday? I think for the most part, you saw Oklahoma, what everybody was looking at was the offensive line. And I thought you saw many times now, Again, just like we talked about in, in the, the Texas spring game, you dictate a lot of stuff early on. And I think Brent Venables uh, and, uh, and, of course, the, the offense, Seth Luttrell, formationally, they did a lot to create light boxes where they would have success running the football a little bit. But then the pass protection was pretty good for the most part, particularly the right side of the line. I did think if you're looking at one negative on the offensive offensive line, I thought over at uh, left tackle, I thought Jacob Sexton had a had a rough day. I thought he had a, had a rough day. There was a lot of pressure over there on that side. But Wee Woo and and uh, Jake Taylor over on the right side, my goodness, they got push. Uh, uh, they allowed Sawchuck. And let me tell you something. I think the big question was who steps up behind Gavin Sawchuck is that other running back who can be the guy that, that kind of becomes the one-two punch and I think one thing that we saw is we saw uh Caleb Hicks stand step up and make some he looks explosive I mean he really really looks explosive Hicks is going to be a guy I think that, that you're going to hear his name called out a lot this fall because at at the running back position man he just he just looked patient and then explosive when he would get through the hole so those were just some things right off the bat of course other 
than the Dion Burks spe mm -hmm. spectacle that he put on. <laughs> And a guy with course blame, we've talked about a lot. But you mentioned the offensive line. I, I think for all the questions, I, I feel like you know, every other day when I get on social media, people talking about Oklahoma's offensive front, and they're not going to be able to compete in the SEC, the physicality of the league, of course. I, I thought it was about, about as positive a performance you could ask. Now, again, it's a really, really tricky thing in a spring game to identify, okay, are we making the strides necessary up front? Because, again, like you mentioned, Blaine, and we've talked about, it's your own guys against your own guys. You're not really going to know until the bullets start flying when we get to kick off in the fall. But I thought all in all a really good spring game. Jackson Arnold I thought looked really, really good. And um, you look at the defense as well. Devon Sears did some good things up front for them. Uh, Ethan Downs was a guy flying around. Um, but the secondary, yet again, it's, it's funny. This seems to be a theme, a theme, Blaine. It almost makes you think. I, I don't – I don't put a ton of stock into it. I, I think there's some merit, but isn't this just kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to SEC football and the offenses and really college football as a whole? Like the game is built for the offenses and especially too in a spring game where the offenses, the defenses, they know each other very well. Um, I think at times that can favor the offense and certainly nobody wants to go to a 10 to seven or seven to three spring game. So it kind of feels like we're, we're pumping the offenses up a little bit to get people excited. Yeah, I mean, I definitely you you don't want to have the effect that we use the example all the time that that uh, Austin Armstrong in Florida had last year by just blitzing your quarterback into oblivion and and making them look bad. You definitely want to give confidence because a lot of the offensive side, especially quarterback play, is about confidence and getting into a rhythm and stuff like that, right? And letting the fans get excited and all this kind of stuff. Because don't forget, now you're open openly so just soliciting dollars in these in these games there are there are nil campaigns that are going on and how do you want to get people excited to give money you want to say hey you see that guy number six that's running wide butt open down the field and just scorching the defense that's because we had the nil funds to go out and get him from purdue and uh, you you want to get more guys like Deion burks and you give us more money and and we'll we'll put that product out on the field for you so that's it's all part of it. I mean, you got to you got to realize that is an actual reality here. You want to get people excited uh, about the program. However, I will tell you that I think Brent Venables and Zach Alley at times were probably like, "Oh, you know, we 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 got some stuff to clean up a little bit." Yeah, I'm sure hard for a guy like Brent Venables and of course now Zach Alley. Difficult for them to watch their own offense go up and down the field, but certainly a lot to correct from the spring game. You feel confident they will get it done. Blaine, before we get off of Texas and Oklahoma, and I, I pair these two together so much, just because of the fact they're both now joining the SEC, right, first year. And I know it's just a spring game. You, you shouldn't, I say, not that you can't. You shouldn't draw conclusions. But did your feeling shift at all on Texas and Oklahoma and how you feel as if they are going to fit in and fare in their first year in the SEC? I'm concerned uh, for Texas defensively a little bit. I really am. Uh, and the reason I'm not as concerned, even though OU had some similar issues, is because of all the experience that comes back at the key leadership-type positions. I mean, you got a, a just – heartbeat there in that linebacker core of Stutzman, of Kanak. You got Desan McCullough, who looks like a baby giraffe out there running around. He's so long and lanky out there, just flying all over the field. We talked about downs, all those guys. I think that I like the foundation of where Oklahoma is defensively right now over Texas, which is not something I don't know. I don't know that I would have said that uh, coming into this this spring game. So I think that's that's one thing there. And then, listen, I do think that Texas is going to be potentially even better than they were last year offensively because you've got all the experience on the offensive line. You got all that speed. Once they really show that meshing of 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 Bond, of Bolden, of Golden, of Jonte Cook, of Ryan Wingo with Quinn Ewers. We didn't even see much out of Amari Nyblack, anything like that. My goodness, it's going to be so many weapons plus those running backs. So I like Texas's offense a little bit more than I thought I would uh, coming into the spring, and I like OU's defense a, a little bit more than I thought I would coming into the spring. Blaine, let's shift gears, go to College Station, Texas, and talk the Texas a and Aggies. And we talked about this, Blaine, last week, but it's interesting how for some programs out there, 
the spring can kind of kind of serve as this no pun intended springboard and where you kind of see stock up and people buying more stock and you get a look at a team in the spring game and it's not about what the stats say but seeing the roster top to bottom and I feel like Texas A&M is one of those I'm really having to exert discipline because I'm like I want to go into a year, Blaine, where I keep things conservative and Texas A&M overachieves. Like, I, when's the last time we gave A&M the opportunity to overachieve? Because the expectations year in, year out are so sky high. But you look at this football team, you look at this roster, and I know there's question marks just like everybody else, but you look at this football team, it's far from an empty cupboard that Mike Elko has inherited. Um, there's questions Ooh. at wide receiver, although Noah Thomas looked fantastic with a pair of touchdown catches. We just mentioned a Purdue transfer. How about Nick Scorton at the defensive end spot? Fantastic player on that defensive front. Connor Wegman, who's still recovering from the injury but did play. He's, I think, as close to 100% as he's been in quite some time, certainly, but made some really nice throws. Even your backup quarterback was really good, Marcel Reed. You look at the secondary, guys they brought in. Shamar Stewart looked great. Scooby Williams, they were all over the field defensively. Blaine, am I being too bullish on AM? Again, I'm trying to exert some, some discipline here because I've been one. I've picked nine wins, 10 wins, whatever it might be for AM over the last couple of years. It's hard not to do that again this year. And I know we're talking here in April, but you can at least see on the field that this isn't a typical year one, what Mike Elko and company are gearing up for. Yeah. Listen, I saw the first, I wanted to see. Connor Wigman, right? I wanted to see, and I saw that first play, him drop back and throw a frozen rope and a tight window on a skinny post, and I said, gig him, I'm in right here. Like, give him to me, because I thought that Texas A&M looked fantastic in this, because it was a balance. You saw the defense, who lost a lot from that defense, Step up and play. We've talked about it, Chris. Some of these, not all spring games, are created equally. I think there is a hunger there in Texas A&M to just wash some of that stench off of them that's been the last couple of years to really say, hey, this is a brand new start. This is what we're about. This is how we're going to play. And the way that you saw Texas A&M's defense with Scooby Williams, who I will tell you, I watched film and breakdown after breakdown and all that kind of stuff from Florida last year. Scooby Williams did not play with great effort at Florida. He did not. I'll just tell you, he didn't. He got he took bad angles in the run game, all that kind of stuff. Scooby Williams played like his hair was on fire in this game, and I was, and that's in a spring game. So I'm really excited about that for them on this defense. You got, of course, Shamar Turner didn't, didn't play in this game, but he's going to be a, a star. We know that. Shamar Stewart did play in this game, and he was all over the field, a former number one prospect back in that big class that they had. And the secondary coming up and laying the wood to folks. Dalton Brooks diagnosed a run early on in that game, went out and just absolutely planted a guy down uh, on the perimeter. Bobby Taylor doing his thing. B.J. Mays coming over from UAB and being physical. A lot of people think physicality means running up and knocking somebody on a tackle. B.J. Mays was physical and coming up and playing through a football one time on a slant going through there. I thought the, the secondary showed a lot to, to you know, Bryce Anderson's a great football player on the back end, uh, and we knew what Taron York was, right? As a, as a mm -hmm. sophomore named a captain, a permanent captain right now, a sophomore, Taron York, after a great freshman year, we needed to look up and see, okay, who is going to, to you know, be there at that linebacker position with him? Well, Scooby Williams answered that. Damian Sanford answered that. Damian Sanford rattled somebody's teeth early on in the game, too. There was some popping going on here. But you mentioned one name, Nick Scorton. And I had to go back, and I was like, okay, Scorton, what's the origin of that word, uh, the country? I was like, oh, that's a old English word for opening up a can of just, I mean, because he was on fire. This guy's going to be a problem. I'm just telling you, Nick Scorton is going to be a problem. And when you pair him with those other guys, so I'm really excited about Texas A&M. It's going to be hard for me to lower those expectations as well. <laughs> yeah, Nick Scorton was fantastic. I think early on, he's one of those guys you look at, maybe a preseason all-conference guy. Hasn't taken a snap in the SEC, but was really good at Purdue and obviously showed those flash in the spring game. You mentioned also, too, Blaine, the running game. Um, thought Le'Veon Moss looked good, but Ruben Owens, I think a 61-yard touchdown run as well. Yeah. E.J. Smith and Ruben Owens at a great 
a uh, pair of backup options or a stable of running backs, if you would, of what Le'Veon Moss, that running game, can do. Uh, quick question, Blaine, before we get off of Texas A&M. Connor Wegman, when fully healthy, we're obviously assuming he's going to make it through the season fully healthy, fingers crossed. In your opinion, is he a top five quarterback in the SEC when fully healthy? It's in terms of the physical traits, yes. Like in terms of he's got every every he's got the size, he's got the arm strength, all that. And I think he's patient. I think he I think he diagnoses things well. I'm excited to see him take that next step forward. So yes, I absolutely think he can be a top five guy when totally healthy. But you mentioned it before. Marcel Reed had a nice game. Let me tell you something. Aggie fans, just like we talked about with Longhorn fans, need to be excited about Arch Manning maybe a year from now. Texas A&M fans should be very excited about Marcel Reed because I would be shocked if he doesn't end up being your number two quarterback. That guy, we talked about it with um, Taylor Green at Arkansas. Okay, we talked about it. We saw it. he. It's not just that a quarterback can run. This guy can run, run. Like Marcel Reed can go. And he's not even a guy that looks to do that. He played in a pro-style, I-formation offense in high school. So he was trained on the classic, you know, three, five, seven-step drop, bootleg, waggle, all that kind of stuff. Deep play action. And he plays very calm, very mature. Found Noah Thomas on a couple of his touchdowns. And Noah Thomas, you said, had a great day. You got Moose Muhammad, all these guys. But I'm telling you, Marcel Reed is a name to know going forward in the future for Texas A&M. And last thing, Blaine, on Adam, I'll say is this. Despite the Aggies losing Anaya Smith, Evan Stewart, I think that wide receiver room could be better this year. When you look at the bodies they've got back, uh, many of the folks down there believe losing Evan Stewart was actually addition by subtraction. Take never what it's worth. But uh, certainly, I don't, I don't think they're going to take a step back at all this year. Might even take a step forward. Guys, before we go any further, really quickly, want to say about our friends over at Roback. Head over to Roback.com. Use the promo code SCCU. At checkout, get 20% off your entire first purchase. Guys, I've been spoiled lately when it comes to golf. Was it the Masters last week? Was it the RBC Heritage this weekend? I'm telling you, Roback is freaking everywhere. If you're not on the wave right now, polos, hoodies, quarter zips, shorts, pants, you name it, all my golfers out there, you already know the drill. Hey, Wesley Bryan uh, is a guy, Roback athlete, nearly won this weekend on the PGA Tour. You saw him rocking it all weekend, so again, it is the best. Jalen Milrose out here wearing it. Coach Ed Orgeron's out here wearing it as well. Again, they got everything you need. It's tailgate season. It's golf season. The weather's warming up. You want to make sure you're equipped with our friends at Roback. So Roback.com, promo code SCCU. Get 20% off your entire first purchase. That being said, Blaine, let's keep it moving. Let's go to Starkville, Mississippi. The Mississippi State Bulldogs. And I understand, listen, the, the scoring system, how it was scored. All I saw was Mississippi State spring game and the final in this one, 67 to 53. And all yeah. I thought to myself was, okay, offense is back. Offense is back in Starkville. Again, the scoring, in case you missed it, guys, was, was weird. It was points for this, points for that. It all wasn't just touchdowns and field goals and extra points, what have you. But still, there was a lot of fireworks. Blake Shapin, Blaine, we got to talk about him. I thought he looked really good. The Baylor transfer. Uh, Kelly Akari, Kevin Coleman, Cedar Treor, their weapons on the outside for him. Shapin looked very in control. Obviously, this is a brand new offense with Jeff Levy. We felt really confident and excited about the 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 different, right? He's going to bring to Starkville. You talked a lot about that. If you can't be better than be different. Did you see the different you were looking for in yesterday's spring game? Man, I don't know if there's a team that I am more – pleasantly surprised by how they looked just from a excitement how they carried themselves the playmakers things of that nature as coming out of this spring as there is mississippi state i mean i'm just telling you they they looked totally different than this the absolute gloom and doom of last year you saw the life uh, revitalization from that mississippi state program you got jeff levy over there looking like he's on a you know 10 day drunk with a gnarly neared over there man and and having a, a a trucker hat with a bulldog on it and nothing else it was fantastic i loved it loved everything about that but when it comes down to it the scheme alone I mean, you see what Tennessee does. There's elements there of what Tennessee does to what Mississippi State's going to do. There's elements of what, you know, the the Baylor Art Browse, because 
FYI, people who don't know, that's uh, Art Browse is Jeff Levy's father-in-law. So uh, he's got a little resource there that he's able to to lean upon in terms of the football side of things. I want to stay away from the rest of it. But when it comes down to it, uh, they have an excitement there in their offensive system, and they have playmakers that can – can go and get it. I think even a guy like Mario Carver, who they called it an absolute steal on the broadcast, he got behind the defense a couple of times, didn't complete one of them, but man, he looked he looked really good. But you mentioned the big three that they have there, whether it's a Akari that comes over from UTEP, had a great season. You you put out a piece on him, I think, earlier this year when the, we hit the portal, how he's going to be a, a breakout star for Mississippi State. He certainly looked like it. He's a guy six foot two, you know, over 200 pounds, has the body and, and just has the skill to go with it. Kevin Coleman looked great coming over from Louisville. And then Seydoux uh, Treor, he actually had a little injury scare. Thank goodness he was fine, but he had to sit out last year after transferring from Colorado. Um, so when it comes down to it, I think they've got weapons for Blake Shapin. The offensive line and the defensive line are always going to be the issue here. Can they hold up? Can they have enough depth? Because you're going to have attrition during the year. But I think just simply the scheme alone is going to help out Mississippi State a lot. Do you expect State Blaine potentially to be active in the portal and, and try to get a couple guys on the defensive side of the football. I mean, it, it seems like that's where they probably need to help. You mentioned lines of scrimmage, the defensive line, adding a couple players. It, it you would think they would be active when it comes to adding quality bodies. I think I think you you know you see these outlets out here that that are heavy into covering recruiting. They they say when a de defensive lineman goes in the portal, they list the teams who have reached out to them and stuff. Well. Mississippi State's in there because they're they're wanting to get more. Okay, they're wanting to get more. Their their logo is on those graphics when you see that because they're they are wanting to get more players there, and that's that's just simply the way it is in the SEC. No matter what it ends up being scheme wise, and you can play fifty three and a half yards wide, all that kind of stuff. When it comes down to it, at some point in the game, at some time during the game, you're going to need your offensive and defensive lines to to step up and, and help take over a football game in order to win whether whether it's momentum all, an upset you're a favorite whatever you got to have that line play and i think they showed decent line play at, at points in time I, I like the way they ran the football but when it comes down to it yeah they're going to need more bodies and i think they'll be active jeff levy he learned from uh from a lot of guys in in the portal over there and lane kiffin being one of them i don't think he's going to be scared to hop in the portal and go get some guys and blaine i know in the spring we try to i think at times we embrace the overreactions but i think for the most part you and i try to be the cooler heads i, I don't want to overreact but i feel like i feel like mississippi state's going to get somebody like somebody's got to lose some football games right that's that's evident, and it's year one. Expectations are, are very conservative. But I think State's going to get somebody. I do. Yeah, I think I mean, Mississippi State's going to get somebody. Yeah, I mean, and and that was – that was what it was under Mike Leach, right? When you would win, when you would get win, reach nine wins for Mississippi State, that comes with being able to take care of somebody that's overlooking you a little bit. Well, I think we all remember uh, coming off of LSU's national championship with Joe Burrow the first game of the season, I think it was the next year, Mike Leach and company just go in there and absolutely ambush them. I mean, just go in there and just hang a big number on them over there in Baton Rouge. And, and that was kind of the beginning of the end there for Ed O as, as, as right after the high water mark. But you talk about early on in this season, you know, they got Eastern Kentucky, Arizona State, Toledo. They could be 3-0 and going into a Florida game at home. It's not – listen – it would not be unrealistic to see Jeff Levy and company start this year 4-0 and after what we saw with, with Blake Shapin there um, because the way that Blake Shapin layered the football, okay, the way that he threw a catchable deep ball to guys who were able to make plays and able to get separation at the top of the route, that's either something you have it or you don't as a quarterback. And Blake Shapin has shown in the past at Baylor he has it. He, his big thing is can he stay healthy? And Blaine, to your point again, that game week four, I think you mentioned it was, against Florida in Starkville, that's going to be the sexy upset pick right there. I think you're going to see a lot a of – night game. Please make it a night game. <laughs> I think that that could – it's funny enough. It may be not funny for obviously both sides, but that could be one that kind of kind of jump starts the Jeff Levy era and effectively ends 
the Billy Napier era. So that, there's a lot on that couple, game. If there's a couple of requests that I could make, okay, to the SEC, if you're listening right now, SEC network officials, email like that, do two things for me, okay? Make it a night game and give me Dave Neal on that because I think for my <laughs> childhood on listening to, I think it was JP Sports yeah. Network, all this, Dave Neal calling a game with like Sylvester Croom on the sideline. And, you know, I mean, all these guys just going nuts for Mississippi State in, in a game that, that nobody else is watching at noon. I want to see it in a night game with Dave Neal. Give me that. Great memories of JP Sports. Sure. Blaine, last spring game that we'll touch on, the final spring game that took place. Later last night, the South Carolina Gamecocks took the field ahead of a pivotal year four. Uh, anytime you got a brand new quarterback, Blaine, that is the talking point. And of course, the question mark all offseason how is South Carolina going to attempt to replace the, the productivity that they lose in Spencer Rattler? Well, Honora Sellers, it looks like, takes over, although South Carolina, they have not officially named him the starting quarterback, which whether you agree, disagree, or what have you, that is where they are. It does seem like Lenora Sellers will be QB1. I thought showed the athleticism in his legs. Uh, Dowell Loggins, Blaine, I'm sure you saw this, the offensive coordinator, and he said this last year before the spring game as well, but he said this during this week that the offense was going to be, quote-unquote, vanilla ice cream, meaning they weren't going to show anything. And the final score in this ball game, Blaine, 17 nothing. It was like watching paint dry. And from the folks I talked to down in their Columbia, I don't know if there was a pass attempted over like seven yards past the line of scrimmage. So you learn virtually nothing in the passing game. I think wide receiver is still definitely a need for them. I think defensively, and I'll let you get to it in just a second, Blaine, but I think they should be better defensively. I think they're bigger. I think they're more athletic in the front seven, although they lost guys in the portal. Uh, and then, of course, line of scrimmage, I think, was the other big thing that fans wanted to see. What did the offensive line look like? From a talent perspective, they should be better. I still think there's a lot of holes to plug there. So, all in all, I don't know that we learned a ton about South Carolina, but there is certainly a lot of reason for excitement and optimism about the dynamic that Lenora Sellers brings to this South Carolina offense if they're going to be willing to open up the playbook. What did you see from the Gamecocks last night? Just saw that it's going to be a – totally different attack than it was a year ago with Spencer Rattler because Spencer Rattler, right, his strength, and, and it's odd too, it's odd, Chris, because his strength was standing in the pocket and throw, throwing the football down the field, but what could South Carolina not do? They couldn't protect him in the pocket. Well, now it looks like, you know, Lenore Sellers' strength and also maybe the strength of this football team with the running backs they've added and a little bit more beef on the offensive line is going to be running running the football okay and he'll be able to contribute to that a little bit too but maybe maybe it does play out a little bit better with Lenore Sellers because there was still the the pass pro leakage right it was it was a lot getting through and a lot of it has to do with those guys on the defense side we'll talk about I'll tell you this though Lenore Sellers is supremely athletic not just not just a good runner He's a elite runner. He's a guy that had, when, I didn't realize, I mean, I've seen him play, but when I looked at him in comparison, I looked real close in comparison to like some of his defensive linemen. And so I'd like standing beside each other. I was like, oh, oh, okay. This guy's that thick and he's running the football like that. 240, 245 and just has quick twitch ability. So that is always going to be an escape route. That's always going to be really, really good. One thing now, I never want to act like I know something that the of the game plan or the coaches know or something like that. So this could have been the plan from Dow Loggins. He could have told uh, Lenore Sellers to do this. But one thing I think we saw out of Lenore Sellers was if the primary read wasn't open, he was taken off and running. It was one read, I'm I'm gone. One read, done. Now, some of that was pass pro sometimes. Some of that was his own decision. That's not going to work no matter how athletic you are in the SEC. Going to have to get better at actually reading defenses, going through progressions, and that's going to come with the, the marriage of the pass pro as well. But I did think uh, Attaway, uh, some of the running backs looked really good. I thought they were improved running the football, which they couldn't do a lick last year, Chris. So that is a big, big thing to be excited about if you're a South Carolina fan. I think running the football is going to be a lot better because you were doing it against guys who are pretty good on that defensive front, like I said. So I think offensively, 
There's a lot to be excited about in terms of athleticism and talent and the ability to run the football. I do think some concerns would be the ability of Lenore Seller to read defenses, and then is there a true playmaker on the outside at receiver because we didn't see it. Mm. And, Blaine, that's where I wanted to go because you mentioned Lenora Sellers, and I, I think fans, South Carolina fans have to be very realistic in their expectations for him because, again, as talented as he is, he still is a youngster. There's a lot to learn. Dabble Loggins' offense from what we heard uh, last year, it is kind of that NFL style to where it, you know, it, it can take a little bit to process or what have you. But I think the bigger questions for him, I think he can throw the football just fine. It's You mentioned the wide receiver position, and it's like who steps up there. Nick Harbour did not participate for what it's worth, in spring ball, getting ready for the Olympics, stuff like that. But I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. It's a little bit of an unsettling feeling when the guy that, you know, you recruited to be in this position, okay, once, you know, Juice Wells and Xavier Leggett and that crew has gone, Nick Harbour is going to slide in there and be wide receiver one. And I just I, – I don't know that it's that simple. So somebody yeah. else is going to have to step up. Uh, you already have some other loose ends on the offensive side with – you know, is the offensive line going to be consistent enough? Is the run game going to be consistent enough? If you don't have the bodies at wide receiver as well, and you're putting all your chips, all your stock into this red shirt freshman quarterback, that can go sideways in a hurry. When it's going well, it'll go really well. But when it's not, the kid is still a freshman. So South Carolina's got to find other guys around, and they've got to find a way, Blaine. I think their number one priority has to be with Sean Elliott, the new running game coordinator, their new uh, running backs coach, Dabble Log and Shane Beamer, they've got to find a way to run the football consistently enough to help out a young quarterback. Like, that's going to be one of the big things that defines success for them. On the defensive side, Blaine, I wanted you to talk a little bit about Dylan Stewart. He jumped off the page when it comes to film. There's a lot of talk about him 24 hours or so after the spring game. Your thoughts on the kind of player he can be, and you mentioned that defensive front as well, but he was a dude that seems stole the show last night. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a stud. Nobody – Nobody thought anything else would happen. I mean, he's he's as highly of a coveted, highly of a just sought after guy as you can get coming to South Carolina. And he's got all the physical traits in the world. Listen, Alabama, Georgia, everybody else wanted him. And if he if he had gone to them, he would be on the field for them early. He's that kind of a talent. I mean, he's he's that kind of a, a player by all accounts. Everybody I know when I was covering his recruitment and my former former job that I was doing, all that kind of stuff. The family's great. You know, it's it's there's nothing not to like about about Dylan Stewart and his future there at South Carolina. So they should have a guy that can do a lot of different things on the field and bring a lot of excitement even early on. But edge a lot of times as a as an edge player, you can you can have success early. Think Harold Perkins, right? How much Harold Perkins was able to come and flash early on as a freshman because a lot of times you can just say, hey, let's go get the let's go get the football, young fellow. Put him out there on the edge and go get it. And I think Dylan Stewart is going to be able to do more than that, but he's going to be able to use his athleticism uh, and have a big year for South Carolina. And Blaine, in closing on the defensive side, and we, we've gotten our notes here, obviously a couple guys that stood out, but Desmond Umi Azulu is a guy that should pot, look pretty good. Kyle Kennard, Demetrius Knight Jr., a couple transfers look really good for them. The, that leads me all to this. Debo Williams at linebacker, Nick Eman Warrior at safety. The defense should be worlds better than it was last year for South Carolina, and bringing back Clayton White was already a controversial decision. If it's not markedly improved, the decision should be very simple. I mean, I'm not saying they should be a top three or four defense in the league, but they got some guys. Like they, they, They've got yeah. some guys – on that defensive side to be a lot better than they were at times last year. And so if we see something similar, I think, to what South kind of dealt with the first 70, 75% of the season, it's a schematic, a scheme issue. I don't think it's going to be a talent issue on that side of the football. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you saw five and nine, when you saw Kennard and Umi Zulu out there as bookends of that defense on that front, that is what they're supposed to look like. You know, I'm, I mean, you got, you got Umi Ozulo over there, 6'6", 244. Kyle Kennard's just another 6'5", 6'6", guy up in that range. And he can absolutely they, – they get after the quarterback. I mean, they do. They Poor uh, Jeremiah Thompson, I believe, at left tackle, the freshman, to, to have to face those guys. I mean, early on, that, that, was, that was the real only part of the South Carolina – offensive line that I was like, Ugh. but 
then you go look at it, and Canard is just doing his thing, and, and you got Umi Ozulu over there. But you mentioned whether it's Debo Williams uh, coming at the linebacker spot or whether it's Demetrius Knight Jr. I thought those two guys played with such passion, such just going after the football, flying around the field, and was excited to see Beamer let these guys get after it. Because we've talked about whether it's Lane Kiffin and the circus that they had over there, not even a spring game. Uh, you got Kentucky and Missouri trying to do glorified two-hand touch and pads, that kind of stuff. I just don't think that gets you better. I think what South Carolina did, while there is risk, you know, they lost their left tackle last year in this in this spring game. There, There is risk to it, but it makes you better. And I think South Carolina got to see some ten tenacity out of their defense that they're going to be able to count on in the fall. Playing five spring games we just discussed all took place, and everyone was in full pads and hit and took each other to the ground. That We're making progress. We're making forward progress. And that does it for all 16 SEC teams. Vanderbilt, of course, did not have a spring game, which is very on brand for Vandy football. But either way, Blaine, the next time you and I sit down like this on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, what have you, We'll be talking actual games, toe meeting leather. We may go live again before that, but the next time we're talking about actual action on the field, games will have taken place. Blaine, last thing, closing remarks before we get you out of here. From the games you saw yesterday, give me an overreaction. And also after that, one team whose stock you feel like rose in your mind, whether it's right, wrong, and different, but from what you saw, what you heard, a team whose stock rose this spring. Uh, people are going to call me crazy and tell me I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and that may be an appropriate you know, term because it is described as a cult sometimes over there in, in Aggie land. But I'm telling you, Texas A&M, Texas A&M, my goodness, I may have to go like buy a Nick Scorton jersey or something. I'm telling you, I'm excited about that man playing football. He looks like his hair is on fire and he is just unblockable at times so you got him joining the likes of shamar stewart shamar turner uh i thought i thought rodis johnson uh who came over from from wisconsin looked really really good so they they've got a lot of guys uh on that defensive front scooby williams played well i loved what i saw of the receivers and the quarterback play i think that texas a&m is going to be a lot better than even we thought uh coming into it overreaction I was going to say, Blaine, I think your overreaction is Texas A&M's a lock for the 12-team playoff. I'm, that, that's not a – <laughs> Hey, a, I'm, I'll, take it, I'll take it a step further. Texas A&M – this is just if I really wanted to be hot takey. Texas A&M finishes with a better record than Texas and Oklahoma. Now, that's a take. That would be a I'm take. I'm not yep. – by the way, nobody clipped that. I'm not saying, but that's <laughs> – hypothetically, that be, that'd be a heck of a take. Hypothetically. That would be That would be a take. I think <laughs> – I think one overreaction that I saw just because I think they're going to be down in games and they're going to have to throw, and I think they've got the weapons to do this, I think Blake Shapin could possibly, if he stays healthy, I'm going to say overreaction, Blake Shapin could lead the SEC in passing this year. I mean, because they're going to sling that pigskin. Mm. They're going to just – Akari, Carver – I mean, just Coleman, they're going to just take – and then uh, Treor, Treori working in the middle there. They're going to throw that thing, and they're going to be down on defense because they can't stop anybody on the back end. <laughs> so they're going to have to throw it, and those games may last five hours for Mississippi State because there's going to be a lot of clock stoppages. Jeff Lebby feels like the perfect fit there and what that passing offense is going to be. And I, I don't know, maybe it's – you know, we all loved, obviously, the late, great Mike Leach. But getting back – it just feels right to get back to that and, and throwing the football down the field. And like, again, seeing Mississippi State with a 67 to 53, I don't care how they got there. But that type of score in a spring game, I'm like, okay, we're, we're getting back to the yeah. good days of Mississippi State football. So, Blaine, a pleasure as always, my friend. Again, the next time we do this and we're talking about games taking place on the field – these SEC teams will be hitting somebody else, and we'll be talking about actual games that took place in week one of the 2024 college football season. Can't wait, my friend. Appreciate you taking the time and looking forward to doing it again soon. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll probably be probably be in August as we're getting into fall camp and talking some of that. We'll have some spreads on these games to talk about, all good good kind of stuff by the time we get back doing our doing our lives on football. 
Indeed. Guys, be sure you hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the bell icon as well so you get notifications of when we go live, when we drop new video content, which is each and every single day. Also, check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We're all across social media as well. And, of course, our website, secunfiltered.com. Until next time, he's Blaine Gilmer. I'm Chris Fultz. We appreciate you guys tuning in. And we'll catch you on the other side.